The RID NAD Code of Professional Conduct, also called CPC, uh, there's a handout uh, and a link listed online that you should be able to download. If not, you can access the information on the website rid.org. This CPC came into effect uh, 2005, as you will see in the handout. Before that, it was called the Code of Ethics, and it pretty much followed the same the same tenets, except that this CPC has uh, guiding principles, illustrative behavior, and it kind of gives you more information and really does serve as a guiding tool because it gives you more to work with. What I want to talk about is what does it mean to say I follow the CPC? Well, it means that you're active and that you participate in your own profession and that you're respectful of it. Uh, it also means that you're current with the standards. So if you're following the CPC, you know that it is no longer called the Code of Ethics. It's now called the CPC. And these are the tenets. Now, as listed on the handout, they are guiding principles. They should be viewed holistically. And the idea driving force behind it is really with the idea of doing no harm. And so what we mean by guiding principles is that it's not intended to be just a simple black and white rule. Understanding that the person in any given assignment is really the only one who understands what's happening. And so the tenants are really asking you to use your professional judgment. They should be viewed holistically, meaning you can't separate one from the other. It's really impossible. Even though in this presentation, I'm trying to really only discuss tenant one in detail, but it, they really all connect together. And something I wanted to point out to you is also on the handout applicability. So who has to follow the code of professional conduct? Well, absolutely certified interpreters have to follow the code, but so do associate members, certified members of the National Association of the Deaf, interns. I want to highlight there that it says students of the profession. I really want to emphasize that this code of conduct now applies to you. That means now. That means that you should really start to become very familiar with this, the CPC, and just really start to view things through that lens because that's the expectation. Students of the profession must also follow the CPC. And so here are the tenants that you should have on that handout as well. There are seven. I have highlighted number one, which is the one that I will focus on for this video. So let's start with this. 1.0 confidentiality interpreters adhere to standards of confidential communication. First, I want to point out to you how it's listed in the CPC as a whole. It starts with a guiding principle, which kind of gives you an idea of where they're coming from in terms of that tenant. Each of them have, have this listed. And again, the reason it's a guiding principle is because only you know what you're facing. As interpreters, we hold such a position of trust and such a privileged, privileged position to be able to participate in moments in people's lives that may be anything from amazing to very difficult, from happy to sad. And that's something we have to be respectful of and responsible with. Information is so 
important. And the idea that someone can share your information is something that we have to treat very delicately. And so we'll go on to some more about what that means. So here's some illustrative behaviors. So if you look at these, these three behaviors, what it's really saying, it's, it's not just about not sharing information, but it's also about how you manage information. Like if you receive an email with assignment details to go to an interpreting appointment and you just leave it open for someone else to look at or you share, oh, I know that person, I'm going to go interpret for them again. I wonder what this is about. Or maybe, as it says there, invoices, time cards, just left out in the open, letting people know or let, giving people the opportunity to look at someone's information. I know, like, for example, for freelance interpreters, some medical assignments require a form to be signed by the facility, by the clinic or the hospital, and it includes a patient's medical number, medical records number, some kind of identifying health insurance information. So think about that. Someone, you have someone's health insurance information on a form. Are you just going to leave it on the front seat of your car as you leave it parked to go have lunch? That's somebody's really important private information. So the way that we manage that is important. But again, 1.3 says there are times where we're mandated to require disclosure of that confidential information. And so it's important that everyone's aware of their responsibilities. So I want to ask you, what does that word even mean to anybody? What does confidentiality mean? mean. This is how the tenets are presented, but I want to ask you to think about for a second, what does that word mean? Well, if you looked it up, if you googled it or tried a dictionary, it would say it's the state of keeping something secret or private the state of not saying anything. But that makes me ask, does information belong to someone? Who, do, who does it belong to? Who has the right to information? It does because even laws agree that information belongs to someone. Information is so valuable. There are businesses that make millions and billions of dollars off of selling information or off of having the right information. Can you think of any laws that might point out to information being valuable? Here's some. People hold information and the ability to hold it as valuable. So much so that so does the government. There is the HIPAA law that protects health care and health information, personal data, the Privacy Act of 1974. And I want you to think about just today in social media, Facebook comes to mind. How rich Facebook is and how did they get there? They had amassed the right amount of personal information so that they can target ads. That makes information really, really almost... Uh, 
impossible to put a price on. So I want you to think about something for a moment. And really, really take a moment to think about this. Think about a time when you had a really great story to tell. Separately, think about a time when you felt you just needed to be alone, you needed some space, you needed some time to yourself. And then lastly, think of a time when you earned an award and how that made you feel. So I'm going to give you like a moment to think about that, like really think about it. So imagine you had such a great story to tell and you're going to run inside the house to tell your parents or your sisters or your brothers and someone's already told the story. What did that feel like? Imagine that moment that you thought about when you needed time to yourself and you just wanted to be alone, but now it's being interrupted and you do not get to have your space. What does that feel like? And then imagine that award that you got and how that made you feel. Imagine you lost it or lost it because it's been taken. The reason I wanted you to think about this is for you to kind of consider what it feels like to be that person who has to share information with a third person, the third being the interpreter, has no choice of it. And so you're the one that holds it. And you can either hold it in a respectful manner and a responsible manner, or you can tell that story, interrupt that time, or lose the value. And imagine what that feels like for the person on the other end. That's really one, one only one part of what confidentiality is about. It's not just about assignment details. It's about the deaf community is so small, and if you share one little nugget that someone else can piece together, the other person can piece together who it is you interpreted for, why you interpreted for them, and, and just really lead to an invasion of privacy. And it may not be so much an invasion of privacy, but even that great story they had to tell has been told. And even that just sucks, right? But think about this. It's not just the belonging of information, that it's not your information to give. It's not your story to tell. It's that the flow of information can no longer be controlled. If you think about one drop of water into a glass or into a pond, once it's gone, you can't control it. You can't take back that drop of water. And that's really what it's about also. It's about you can't control it once you release it. And it's not yours to release. So here's some quick questions for you. See if you can answer before I show the answers. Yes or no? Can you post on social media because you want to showcase your skills and show your friends or your family or even employers the work that you do? Can you meet with a colleague? Uh, let me start over. You meet a colleague for the first time and you want to tell him he has such a lovely family because you have interpreted for them. Can you do that? And last question is you had a difficult assignment and you want to reach out to a mentor. Can you reach out to the mentor and discuss the assignment? 
So I'm pausing for a moment for you to have your answers solid in your mind. And now I'll show the answers. <clears throat> you cannot post on social media. And I know that as students of interpreting, you see a lot of this and you see mixed messages. And I have to tell you that it is not correct and it is not appropriate. And you do not and will not see all interpreters doing this. You see a handful. Another person, a participant can post the interpreter. The deaf person, anybody else can post the interpreter. The interpreter cannot post the concert. Posting uh, an assignment like a concert is no different than posting a dentist appointment. It's confidential. You cannot, you cannot post assignments. And I know that people get confused or, or they make an excuse for, uh, well, this was a public event and while well, it's already out there, it can be out there. It can be out there. All other people put it out there. But as the interpreter who worked that job, you cannot post it on social media. You can't put it on your website. You can't put it on your resume. You can say in a general way, I have interpreted concerts. I have interpreted blah, blah, blah. But you cannot, you cannot be specific. You cannot meet someone for the first time and tell them, oh, I've interpreted for your family members. They're so amazing. No matter how amazing they are, you cannot share that information. They can tell you. They can say, hey, you were the interpreter for my wife or whatever the case. You got me. But you cannot be the one to initiate that sharing of information. What about a difficult assignment? Yes. And you will see in the guiding principles, as needed, professional judgment. It is appropriate and it is advisable that you reach out to a trusted mentor or a colleague to discuss general terms of a difficult assignment because this is also part of professional growth. And it's also part of your own mental health the ability to discuss assignments, but also to get feedback and maybe to learn from someone. What would you have done? Or what do you suggest I do next time? How do I handle this? That is absolutely appropriate. So the next tenet is number two, as you see highlighted there. And that'll be the next video but I want you to think about tenant number two and kind of look at it on the handout look at the guy look guiding principle and the illustrative behavior to kind of get an idea do some brainstorming about what tenant two can entail and encompass that's it thanks <laughs>